Hello, my friend. How are you? I'm good. Good. How are you doing, Liberty? I'm good. Thanks. Thanks for joining me. We're going to have a lot of fun, I think, talking about payments, right? What's more exciting than payments? Everybody <laughs> is like, it's their favorite topic, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. Am I the first guest to be uh, recording a podcast with you a second time? I think so. Yes, you're uh, oh, okay. officially like, uh, <laughs> what's the word then? Alumnus of the podcast now. Great. Glad to be here. So payments, just for context, I don't pretend to know a ton about the field. I'm no expert. I'm still learning. I think I've been paying attention for a few years just because to me, it's inherently interesting, right? It's like in the same way that logistics is the circulatory system of the world moving things around. I feel like payments is kind of like the same thing, but for money and money as the core is information, right? It's sending information around the world to make stuff work better. So telling the baker to make another cake, it's telling GM to make cars, right? So th that stuff is interesting to me as a system. But then as I started paying a bit attention to it, I realized that just how complex it is, right? Everything, every <laughs> transaction has like five, six, seven parties. Everybody's doing something. The acquirer and the bank and the issuer and the processor and someone's doing fraud detection. Sometimes it's all the same party doing a few of those things. Sometimes they're all split up. Our mutual friend, David Kim, has written a bunch about it. I think he started like with Visa and MasterCard, and that's, that's kind mm -hmm. of where I started. And he covered Adyen and Stripe and Pfizer and Global Payments and Square and PayPal. And so he, he wrote a bunch about it. I learned a lot from him. Uh, I learned a lot from our other mutual friend, Jerry Capital, uh, who's yes. been doing his own deep dive into payments for a few years. And now I, I've also learned a lot from you. Uh, you've done a bunch, <laughs> like, I think starting with Shopify, which is kind of partly payment. And then... Yeah. Um, You've done Square and Adyen and now PayPal. So I thought it was a great occasion to kind of try to bring it all together and talk about it a bit. So that's my long intro. But I also have to point out before I forget that if anyone's interested in the history of PayPal, you got to check out the book by Jimmy Sony. It's called The Founders and it's very, very excellent. I did a book giveaway a while ago and I can announce now that I'm going to do another giveaway for this book and another of, of Jimmy's book about Cloud Shannon. So this is mm. a, a great one to start with. But where do you want to start? What's, what, what, yeah. How did you get into payments? <laughs> you know, I, I, the one thing that I've kind of picked up uh, from your intro is I sense a dichotomy of what a consumer experiences when it comes to payments and what's really working behind the scenes, right? So for a consumer, or like even for myself, before really getting into the details of payments, value chain, it was always very simple. Like, you know, I just, you know, pull out my credit card and like use it on point of sales or like, you know, uh, or I, I just click some box, usually it's, you know, automatically populated, you know, in my browser or in, on, on, in a particular website. And that's it. It feels very simple to me. Right. But the reality is probably, you know, couldn't be any more different, right? It, it's this incredibly complex system, as you mentioned, like there are like six, seven, you know, parties involved in a single transaction, which takes seconds to complete. But there is a lot of work that's being done behind the scene. And I think it is very much underappreciated how complex it is, uh, not only by the consumers, but also many investors. Like I didn't probably appreciate how complex it is uh, until I actually did the work. Uh, yeah. And now I kind of realize that it's just an, an incredibly complicated you know, value chain where a lot of you know, you know, incredibly valuable companies have been created. And, and because it's very complex, it can be challenging to predict where it's going. There are lots of segments here. One is like in the legacy payments players, and there's next generation payments players, and also you know there's crypto, mm. right? So to like where exactly this is going, you know, five, ten, twenty years from now can be challenging. And I think it's a challenge for existing incumbents, the next generation payments companies, and also, like I said, in you know, a crypto, you know, to what extent the potential of crypto, you know, the crypto optimists that talk about uh, is, is going to be realized, will have a profound impact and implication for the current payments value chain as well. So it's an interesting space, I think, and it would be awesome to kind of, you know, follow this space. And I feel like my knowledge has compounded a little bit hmm. uh, after like doing like three, four companies. But it, again, it is nowhere complete, right? Nowhere close to uh, be complete. Uh, it will still require closely following the space going forward to be able to, because I feel like it's, it's very dynamic. Like, you know, Amazon is coming up with this Amazon with buy with Prime. 
I can definitely imagine some scenarios as some investors probably do, like how that can profoundly impact PayPal or, or Shopify, right? But these are, you know, th these companies are incredibly dependent on their payments revenues, right? On their checkout revenues. And also there's also this, you know, Facebook pay, Google pay, Apple pay, right? So, you know, it's, it's all a very complex value chain. We can probably talk about for hours and hours. Yes, as our friend Jerry would say, like it's going to be uh, so many buttons, right? You're going to go to check out and it's going to be like 15 different buttons. There's a stat I got, I think, from your PayPal uh, deep dive. Mm -hmm. Something like 20% of online transactions are declined, right? So most yes. of these companies are in the business, basically, of trying to increase sales by removing all of this friction and catching the fraud and all that. And I think you put it very well, like... From the customer's point of view, it's very simple, but it's like a Wizard of Oz kind of thing. Like there's the wizard behind the curtain that's juggling 15 balls. Just looking at PayPal, say, let's start with PayPal because that's the, mm -hmm. your latest deep dive. It feels like they, on one hand, have a very good product in that it increases this completion of transactions for, for merchants, right? Mm -hmm. But the question always seems to me like, how much of those economics are going to the merchant and how many are going to PayPal? And, and not to jump to the conclusion, but that was kind of my main thing when I was reading your deep dive about PayPal. It's like, okay, they started with this checkout button and sending money via email. That was super great. And over time, they did so much M&A to diversify into other things, right? And so now Braintree is a kind of a, a huge processor and they got some Venmo in there that's, that's kind of growing nicely. But at the end of the day, this checkout button is so profitable for them. I think mm -hmm. that you said the CEO said something like it's, Checkout is to PayPal like searches to Google, right? That's kind of a, yes. a big statement, right? Yes, an apt statement, I would say. So to me, the main question I would ask if I was a PayPal shareholder would, would be, with all this competition coming, like this sea of buttons coming, is PayPal thinking too short term about its advantage? Because if I'm a merchant and I put a PayPal button in there and now all of a sudden I make a lot more sales, well, whatever I'm paying in fees to PayPal, as long as I'm making more in sales, like I'm, I'm going to be happy, right? But then PayPal mm -hmm. has kind of been cranking up the fees and charging more. And I think now it's like almost 3.5% plus 50 cents. Yeah. And at some point, like the merchant is going to be like, okay, they're getting me more sales, but am I keeping it in my pocket or is it all going to PayPal? And so as a merchant, it's becoming less attractive. So I may want, I may be tempted to be more prominent with Shop Pay or with Apple Pay or with Amazon or whoever is charging less? Is it, is it going to be a race to the bottom, do you think? Yeah, that's a great question. And like I, I have my own business. I use Stripe to process my payments on my website, MBI Deep Dives. And I have like my, let's say, own personal grievances in terms <laughs> of how the whole system works, uh, especially now that I know. So some of these companies, like an Adyen, is like, extremely profitable, right? right? Stripe is probably nice. It's not publicly listed, so we don't know exactly how profitable it is. But I guess expectation is Stripe will also be incredibly profitable. I kind of don't like the fact that they don't have like different pricing tier. Like I understand, like you know, if I'm uh, processing ten thousand dollar per year. There can be chargebacks and all that, and you I, I, you need some protection to process my payments. And I can totally understand if you charge me, uh, like for example, like on Stripe, if I'm processing ten, twelve dollar transactions, and uh, I pay like five, six percent yeah. of that amount to Stripe, right? And that's fine. Let's say if I'm doing like ten thousand dollar payment processing, and I understand, like you know, Stripe needs to make money from every single customer they're underwriting, but. When I'm scaling from 10,000 to 100,000, 100,000 to 200, 500, a million, right? Unfortunately, it remains the same. And I feel like it shouldn't be, yeah. right? I think uh, these companies, they should have like different pricing tiers as my payments processing from their margin scales, but that usually doesn't happen. And what ends up happening is these businesses become exceptionally profitable. Now that's great news for <laughs> shareholders of those companies, right? But I do wonder, Hmm. whether you know there can be pressure on that front or whether you know one business may want to take that opportunity like you know what i want to have different pricing tiers for different merchants uh, 
depending on their sales. There is pricing tiers, but the differences are like exceptionally wide, like for enterprise customers. And yeah. like, those are like more bespoke, ad hoc, like you, know, you need to talk to their sales team and you know to kind of you know, negotiate with them. But the difference is so large, like for people like, let's say me, I'll never be probably be enterprise customer for Stripe, right? Stripe makes a lot more money from me than any of the vendors. Like I usually use, like say Twitter as my top of the funnel. And I think all the vendors or all the products that I'm using to kind of run my business, Stripe makes the most money out of my business. Hmm. And again, it, it, is, it just goes on to show how payments business can be incredibly valuable because if they just needed to convince me once that I need to use Stripe. And once I did that, as I'm scaling, Stripe is scaling as well. And the profitability for Stripe is actually increasing exceptionally, right? There is probably, you know, a very little cost to kind of keep me like, I, you know, they don't have to do any advertising or anything to keep me, right? So we, even like for companies like PayPal, what they would say, or even I think Stripe would say the same thing, and most of these payment companies will say the same thing, like when they're raising price, let's say, or not decreasing price, they're basically saying, and PayPal says this, that when users or consumers say, see PayPal button, they trust that button. Yeah. They don't abandon the cards. And PayPal would also say the authorization rate is high. The probability that the sale is complete is exceptionally high compared to its other buttons. So it's kind of tricky. It's very hard to say with conviction that PayPal is raising prices at the expense of the margins. Yeah, we don't have the data to be sure how much value they're adding, right? Right. If it's indeed true that 50% of users basically abandon the card, if they don't see a PayPal button, yes, then definitely PayPal is probably adding a lot more value than they are taking from the transaction. But I guess the question that I come back to and when you think about competitive forces, again, as a consumer, who do you trust more? Which button do you trust more, Apple Pay or PayPal? Mm. Google Pay or PayPal? I personally probably trust Apple Pay more, right? Or, or Google Pay more. As I think you know, people may misinterpret what I mean by trust. Like, like you know, I'm probably, let, let me put it this way. Which one I'm more inclined to click? Yeah, that's a good test, right? Reveal preference. Exactly. And I think I'm probably more tempted to click Apple Pay. What if Amazon Pay was there too? Or Shopify? Like, I'm curious if all of them are there, is there one at the top of the stack that you would click first? I'm trying to think for myself which one it would be. Maybe Amazon. I don't know. It kind of, no, it kind of depends. If I'm paying with Amazon Pay and it ensures me that that product that I'm buying is going to be delivered like in one day or two days versus let's say yeah. if I'm paying through PayPal or ShopPay and there is no such guarantee in terms of delivery schedules. So in that case, yes, I'd be tempted to click Amazon Pay. Yeah, I think that's their way to add value. They're leveraging their huge logistics that nobody else has. ShopPay may be the best implementation in many ways that I've tried for the software, the flow, when you click on it, was very, very good. But even if Amazon is not quite as nice, if I get free shipping with Prime and I get it the next day, or yeah. I think that beats a lot, right? That's hard to compete with. And that is such a classic Amazon way to get into this space, right? I was talking to Jerry about this, and J Jerry was mentioning that, you know, how Amazon is basically leveraging the hard mode, which is logistics. You can't really replicate Amazon's logistics, and Apple can't. Like, no payment companies can possibly even dream of replicating what Amazon has built in their logistics capabilities. So they have, they're leveraging their hard mode investments. Mm -hmm. to get into, which is perhaps a more easy mode, you know, space, like in the sense that it's easy to kind of, like I said, you know, once you get a customer, once you get a merchant to sign up for your, or to allow your button to appear on your website, then you probably don't have to do a lot more. You can just milk that relationship for years and years. The retention rate is probably a lot higher from that relationship. And again, like if Amazon can deliver the Prime-like benefits with that button, I can definitely see like why Prime members specifically would be very, very tempted to click mm -hmm. that button instead of any other buttons that's out there. By the way, I was just you know, looking at, we are recording this on 29th of June, and yesterday Pinterest uh, announced a new CEO. The CEO, I think I forgot the name, uh, he used to be at Google and uh, looking at their shopping ambitions and all that, but he also used to run Braintree and Venmo 
at PayPal.、Oh, right. So I'm wondering whether there will be a new button, maybe Pinterest button or Pins <laughs> button. The buttons are definitely not declining in numbers; it's only increasing. But yeah, there's definitely a bit of a hyper hyperinflation in terms of button over the last like five ten years. Yeah, and, and we didn't even talk about the buy now and pay later. Stuff right, all the affirm <laughs> and afterpay and all that is coming too. It's, yes, it's going to be a, quite a jungle of buttons in there. I do think, like at some point, I think the window is closing. Yes, it's definitely possible for me to imagine Pinterest button on Pinterest, but I think it would be hard for Pinterest to kind of like be pervasive in other websites. But ultimately, I don't expect Apple, Google. Meta or Facebook? I think Facebook is kind of you know rebranding it as MetaPay. So Apple, Google, Meta, Amazon, Shopify, Samsung, right? I don't think these are going anywhere. And obviously PayPal. Yeah. So these buttons will be there on every single, like not every single website, but most websites over time. So ultimately, it will come down to the customers. Who are going to be more tempted to click those buttons? And like I said, buttons are extremely profitable.、Hmm. And so I don't think the big tech companies are going to give up their ambitions on the payments. I wonder if this is going to follow like an inverted U shape, where at some point more buttons is going to decrease conversions、yeah. and going to just confuse customers. So、mm. are we in the moment kind of early into that, where everybody's throwing whatever against the wall, and then at some point this is going to be a power law, right? Is it going to be just a few that really stick, and at some point merchants just kind of clean up their checkout page because it's getting too much, and then whoever is left at the top is probably going to be extremely profitable because this is a scale business. This is like fixed cost business, so the more volume you drive through it, like that's why we're seeing Adyen's margin that、like, keep going up, and at some point it's like okay, there's a ceiling at a hundred percent, right? It's gonna stop going up at some point, but so far they've been scaling very, very well. I think Adyen has basically never raised capital. They, it's incredible how capital efficient they are. I guess we can talk a bit more about Adyen later, but so is PayPal going to be one of those? Remaining winners, and the other thing that stood out from your deep dive, which is making me question if PayPal is positioning itself right, is about management. You have Peter、mm-hmm. at Adyen that's like a founder is thinking super long term. He's always thinking about many years ahead. And you were talking about PayPal's management, and it's a bit less certain there, right? How long term are they thinking? Is the CEO kind of like, okay, I'm going to be out in a few years, so if I, you know, crank up the fees in the meantime, the profits are going to be super great. You know, I get out of here, but. Yeah, in five years and ten years, is is whoever is in charge of PayPal gonna realize that they've kind of burned some goodwill with customers, that they've opened up kind of an umbrella under which competitors that are doing a very good job at a lower price can get a footing,、mm-hmm. and then once these competitors start having the scale to compete, you know, they get more profitable, they can reinvest more in this. That it's kind of like the Stripe model of always launching new products and trying to expand into new areas. Is PayPal really doing that? Well, like they've been buying tons of companies, but it's still the checkout button that seems to be like the big engine. So that, that's a good question. So Dan Schulman, who is the CEO of PayPal, I think it's not about Dan Schulman specifically. It's just a system under he operates. Like he's not the founder. He can be easily fired, right?、Yeah. You can't probably fire Peter or the Collison brothers or you know Zuckerberg, good luck,、right? <laughs> Tim Cook, Sundar Pichai. These people are probably not going to be fired, even if their business stumbles for a couple of years. But yes, I think someone like Dan Schulman can definitely, can certainly be fired if he doesn't deliver. It's not about you know PayPal or it's not about like you know what Dan Schulman is doing. Like that's the that's the system he's part of. Yeah, the incentives, right? Even the management incentives. You pointed them out. Like his bonuses are tied to relatively easy to meet targets. Yes, like、uh, set first, I saw the 2021 medium term incentives was like 50% FX neutral revenue CAGR, and then FCF free cash flow CAGR、uh, over the last three years, and the range was like three percent to five percent, three percent growth, four percent growth, five percent growth, and if you if they attained five percent growth, then they would get 200% of their payout, and that. You know, at first surprised me, like why by generating five percent FCF CAGR, they are being paid two hundred percent of their payout. And then I realized, okay, the low number is probably because of some adjustments that they had to do, whatever. But even then, the range is just so low—three, four, five. 
three yep. percent for fifty percent of the payout, four percent for hundred percent of the payout, and five percent for two hundred percent of the payout. And when I looked at like some other uh, the proxy statements in 2018, 2019, 2020, you will see like there's a significant difference. Uh, like sometimes like say, their target is like let's say uh, on the high end of FCF CAGR is 20 percent. What did they deliver? 31 percent or something like <laughs> that. So that tells me those numbers were not demanding enough. If your high range is 20 percent and you end up delivering 30 percent, 40 percent CAGR growth. That means either the board fundamentally underestimated the business's potential and they're not really setting up the targets in a way that should be difficult enough for the management to exceed. And if you look at the compensation for the named executive officers, they're like four or five, and they've been paid $200 million over the wow. last three years, just three years. Dan Schulman gets paid $30 million. Yeah, he got paid last year. That's what I mentioned, like, you know, he's under pressure. He has to deliver. Like, he doesn't have as much uh, longer time horizon as, let's say, Peter Van Der Does or, or Collison Brothers or Zuckerberg has. So it's, it's just the system he's part of. And if he doesn't deliver, and that's why I think he's much more prone to take decisions, to deliver near-term results, which may or may not be good over the long term. Exactly. There's always the results that you get, but how did you get them? right? Especially mm. with these financial businesses, there's always some levers you can pull to, in the short term, increase free cash flow or margins or whatever, right? If you're the CEO and you're thinking like, okay, I'm going to be out in two years. Well, if I slow down hiring for a while, maybe yeah. margins are better and I reach and I get 200% of my bonuses, but maybe you've mortgaged the future of the company, like because they have less R&D or some people working in, in the fraud department don't have the resources or that could be something that you won't see immediately, but over time you compound some problems, right? If you increase the fees to your merchants from 2.9 to 3.45, 2.49%, they're not going to all churn out the first year, right? For a few years, yeah. like the profitability is going to look great, but yeah. that's not going to be good at the margin of, well, that's confusing. The margin for, for merchants, right? I mean, the, the marginal yeah. merchant that's like, yeah, should I keep PayPal? Should I not? Should I try something else? Like if they're kind of sitting on the fence and you increase price on them, they're, they're going to churn sooner than later. Yes, if Stripe raises price for my website, let's say, yes, I'll be actively looking for alternatives, mm -hmm. right? I may not switch instantly because it's kind of in a cumbersome process to you know, switch your payment processor, but you can bet I'll be looking to switch. And like I said, I'm already not happy. The fact that this payment fees is a variable expense for me. I think they should be able to scale it better for the margins, right? And that's why I think, you know, it's possible the big tech companies, they may not look to generate 50, 60% margins from this business. But the problem is basically there's like too many parties in the system. So I don't think the card networks are going to take lower basis points uh, as you scale. So those, some of these numbers are fixed, right? Yeah. So for the margin acquirer and the processor and some other like, you know, the companies who are doing settlements and all that, they are the ones they may have to decide, right? They may have to decide to lower their take rates. So that's the question, like, why does Adyen deserve to generate 70%, 60% in a margins? So that's the question I kind of grapple with. Well, it feels to me like right now in the world that they're playing, right? Adyen started at a super high hand, like huge multinational companies. And they come into Adyen because they're like in 50 different countries and they have tons of currencies. And like Adyen was the best at dealing with that. And because partly they have this stack that they've built themselves, it's all vertically integrated. Like they play the role of multiple of the parties in the chain. And so they can provide a more value add you know, service to their yes. customers which increases the authorization rates and basically it pays for the higher fees that Adyen has compared to others. So that feels like at the high end, like that's kind of the value proposition of Adyen. This is putting them into a nice position for going down market because they have these high margins and right now they don't have to cut them. They're still growing like crazy. But if they go and attack Stripe, say at the lower end, well, it's not going to be easy because it's not the same market. It's much more fragmented and everything. But Stripe is getting these much higher take rates because the market is so fragmented and like small customers don't have the leverage to negotiate better pricing the way that uh, Nike or whoever would with Adyen. But mm -hmm. if Adyen goes down market, they could take their fees down significantly and still be decently profitable. And that could be the way that they kind of buy growth in there. 
that they can, uh, can come under Stripe and the others and bring some competition to the lower end. I don't know if they have any plans for that. I don't, maybe there are reasons that I don't know about that would prevent that, but it feels like they have this huge margin that they can play with. And if they kind of mm -hmm. decide to squeeze the margin, all of a sudden, like, this is going to buy them growth, right? Yeah, so I, I think I need to rephrase what I say. So it's actually more probably relevant for other players than Adyen. Adyen definitely plays in the enterprise market and their take rate is like minuscule, 20 bips. But because of the scale, the yep. margins is like, you know, enormous. But I don't think like, you know, obviously the companies they're dealing with, the enterprise customers they're dealing with, they have negotiating leverage, right? Almost all of them have multiple PSPs. So it's not like, you know, they are completely beholden to Adyen. The fact that even despite that, Adyen still has like 60-70% incremental margins goes to show that the business is just, you know, the cost structure of the business is just, you know, much better, right? Uh, it's, so, uh, it's a beauty. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, you know, they're all basically all, the only cost is basically, you know, uh, salaries to employees, like after net revenue. And most of their employees are, are based in Netherlands. And because of some, you know, regulations in Netherlands, uh, you know, their bonus cannot be actually more than 20% of their base salary. So, which is, is a kind of a nice cap compared to someone in Silicon Valley, like yeah. most of the you know, Stripe employees are. And the difference between those like, you know, employees based in the Netherlands versus employees in the Silicon Valley is order of magnitude higher in terms of salaries expenses. Also, Stripe has 7,000 employees versus Adyen's roughly two, two and a half thousand, right? That is an enormous difference. Uh, and that's why I think Adyen is definitely is way more profitable company compared to Stripe, although Stripe processes more payments, like 10% more than Adyen did in 2021. Oh, we know that for sure because Stripe disclosed it. But what we don't know about the profitability, but even I think we don't need to know based on what we know in terms of the number of employees and based on what we know where those employees are based for Stripe versus Adyen, yeah. it is abundantly clear that Stripe's profitability is nowhere close to Adyen's. And I wonder whether they will ever be close to anywhere close to Adyen because Adyen has some structural advantage. Like, you know, those are regulatory advantage. It's not necessarily. And maybe, yes, Stripe can do that if Stripe, you know, bases their headquarters in Netherlands and starts hiring people uh, there, right? But I don't think that's really a feasible solution. But yeah, I think my comment, earlier comment about, you know, why Adyen deserves to generate 60-70% margin is probably more relevant for other players, right? Because uh, the, the players were dealing with margins like me who have no negotiating leverage, right? And so that's the question, right? You know, if let's say in some future time, Stripe is generating, I don't know, 60% margin or 40-50% EBIT margin, Adyen can probably say, you know what, I don't need to generate 50% EBIT margin from this segment, right? right? I want to compete in price, right? If they are, you know, authorization rate is similar to Stripe, even in this segment, at some point, they may want to get into this space. I don't know, like, you know, because these are enterprise and, and SMB are just so different, it's not easy to decide and, and get into both segments. So who knows, it may take years and years or probably it may end up being too difficult for Adyen to get into SMB space. But that's a concern, right? If someone who's operating in the SMB space dealing with customers with no negotiating leverage, ends up finding competition from other PSPs who wants to give better rates for these SMBs, then yes, the companies who are operating in the SMB space may not end up generating as high margin as, let's say, Adyen generates in the enterprise space. I think the implicit assumption by most investors investing in Stripe is basically Stripe will be able to replicate what Adyen did in the enterprise market. That remains to be seen. We don't know. Like we, Again, since Stripe is not public, we don't have as much data to really compare and do a more concrete analysis with their cost structure and profitability and everything. But I'm not too optimistic that Stripe's profitability number will ever be anywhere close to Adyen's. Yeah, that's that's when I wish Jerry was here because I think he's done a pretty good deep dive into what we know about Stripe and his conclusions seem to be that the way Adyen is kind of vertically integrated and does a lot of things in house is partly what makes them perform well, but also what makes their kind of structural profitability. 
and Stripe doesn't quite have that. I'm going to make a terrible analogy that doesn't work, but hopefully it's an intuition pump, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say that Adyen is kind of more like Apple. So they're vertically integrated. They make the hardware, the software, the product. They kind of like build the whole widget, right? And because they control all of it, they can make it better, basically. And Stripe, there can be more than one way to win, right? So Apple is winning one way, but maybe Stripe's way of winning is more like, say, Amazon. So they, they mm -hmm. have lower margin, but maybe they grow faster. They have more volume and they build all these other businesses around it, right? They have Stripe mm -hmm. Capital and Stripe Tax and uh, they have these no-code tools for small merchants' website and like they're easier to deploy everywhere. And because of that, they kind of grow more virally or something. My payment processor is also Stripe. And mm -hmm. at some point there was a feature that was kind of missing for me. I was like, I can do this. I can send a payment link, no code. But if I want to have a, a customer page where they can change their information, I have yeah. to build it on a website, right? So I went to uh, Patrick McKenzie on Twitter, who works at Stripe, mm. and I wrote to him like, hey, I wish this feature existed. Well, Stripe has people uh, monitoring Patrick's replies. I don't know if Patrick forwarded it or they just look, but I was contacted by people at Stripe. And like mm. a couple months later, they came back to me and said, we build a feature you wanted, you want to beta test it. So I was on a call with two Stripe engineers and we tried the feature, they enabled it on my account. It's like, okay, that's kind of a, an important advantage as a culture to be able to move fast, listen to your customers, yeah. try to kind of feel the market and adapt to it. Adyen's culture, I don't know if it, it'll do as well with that kind of thing, right? Where you have to yeah. have a lot of customization for small players. Like I think Adyen's is basically trying not to have customization for yes. customers. They're trying to keep their stack monolithic in some ways, which has many advantages, but may have some problems at other parts of the market. I don't know. So I feel like maybe both Stripe and Adyen's are going to be the winners in their way and keep taking share for a long time from like Global Pay and Fiserv and all the other legacy mm -hmm. players that are like 50 different companies cobbled together through M&A and they have all these different internal systems that don't quite talk to each other and that'll never be as smooth an experience as Adyen. But even if Stripe is not like as streamlined internally, like on the technical side as Adyen, maybe they can make up for it by you know building this ecosystem of services and products around it that make them uh, still the, the most value added choice for a lot of merchants and you know people needing payments uh, yes i'm definitely you know more optimistic about stripe chances to process more payment volume than let's say adian mm -hmm. uh, in fact and they already do and it's possible that the difference between adian and, and stripe can increase over time in terms of the payments volume being processed but I know my comment was basically mostly related to the profitability, yeah. right? So the margins, you're right, you know, yes, like, you know, you don't have to generate 50% margin to for Stripe to be successful, right? Stripe can be very, very successful company, even with significantly lower profit margins than that, if they just become a pervasive payments processor. And as you mentioned, like, you know, WorldPay, Pfizer, and uh, some of this legacy, AJ Morgan Payment Tech, the largest incumbent payment processor companies, they still generate more than $4 trillion payments, right? So people who don't follow payments market can be surprised how large this market is. Because it's such a large market, it doesn't necessarily have to be either or, right? If Stripe wins, doesn't mean Adyen loses. If Adyen wins, doesn't mean Stripe loses. They both can be successful, especially if they both are successful in taking market shares from the current legacy uh, incumbent players. Not only just top three, it's, it's a, there's a long list of companies. And these are very disparate systems and across the value chain. Even like after like the top three or four incumbents, there's still like a significant amount of market share that can be taken from the legacy players in the payments value chain. It's it definitely feasible for multiple players to be big winners. But at the same time, it all kind of depends on valuation and all that. That's also a big factor. Mm. And I think I should also probably sh should have mentioned this in the very beginning of this podcast. I want to disclose that I own you know, Google, Facebook, or Meta, Amazon, Square, or Block. And I also own Shopify. So a lot of the companies that I've discussed, I don't own Adyen or Stripe or, or PayPal. So there can be some biases as I speak about these things. But yeah, it's possible that both Adyen and Stripe can be successful companies. So I have a question for you, and it's impossible to answer it like precisely, but I'm curious about like your sense of the direction, right? So when I look at these companies, I like to think of, of them not only as static points, like where, where are they today, but kind of as vectors, right? They're moving mm -hmm. in certain directions. Some are faster, some are slower. So the question is, 
Do you think the new kids on the block, Adyen and Stripe and PayPal is kind of like late teenager by this point, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But are they improving faster than the legacy players are improving? Are the legacy players kind of catching up and at some point, is it going to be not a free for all, but like a cage fight between all of them because they're kind of all at the same point, right? Is uh, Global Pay and Pfizer, are they like integrating all this M&A and streamlining it? And at some point they're going to have like a really good system or are they falling behind and the new ones are kind of like running away with an impossible lead. So in 10 years or 15 years, the new ones are going to be the new incumbents with a massive share and we'll see if others come in. But I'm just curious in your sense, is legacy kind of catching up in the same way that if we're electric cars, some people may say, well, okay, Tesla was alone for a while, but now like GM and Ford and Volkswagen are coming. Yeah. Or no, it's the new guy building a lead that's very hard to catch up. Yeah. So let me start from Adyen and kind of tie back to uh, your question. So, you know, when I was looking at Adyen and I, I wrote my deep dive on Adyen, one of my concerns was basically how sustainable is their margins and how they can possibly attract great talent without paying commensurate salaries or compensation compared to uh, Adyen's peers. Even if I look beyond the regulation stuff like Netherlands versus Silicon Valley and all that, even in the US, Adyen pays considerably lower compared mm. to, let's say, Stripe or some big tech companies. So I had this concern and I still have that concern, but I was also thinking power laws are pervasive. Power laws are everywhere. Yeah. And I was wondering whether Adyen may win because of the decision that they consciously took and the power law distribution of that one decision may just end up compensating for all the possible shortcomings that they may have in our decision point. So for example, let's say their decision to not pay commensurate salaries in the US versus Stripe or some other companies, this is flawed. But if Adyen basically exists because of the problems that these legacy incumbent players have created through endless acquisitions, so they have acquired tens of companies over the years and decades and decades were, went by as they kept in acquiring more and more companies. And because payment value chains has increasingly become more complex, and I think it's not becoming simplified you know, as years go by, Adyen is trying to build a solution or a system where it's very seamless, where every part of the system can talk to each other, whether you are buying from the store, online, omnichannel, like all these different ways consumers can buy products and services. Adyen's solution is just much more seamless compared to not only the incumbent, but also I would say even the fellow disruptors, right? So I, I just want to point out for listeners who may not be as familiar with Adyen, the founders of Adyen are payments insiders we used to work in the industry. I think they sold a company right. and basically Adyen, the name, even the name means starts again. And so they basically looked at kind of like the, the founders of Snowflake, right? They were in the business and they saw all of the problems and the mistakes that others were making. And they thought we can do better. We're going to start with a clean sheet of paper and do it right this time. And so I think you're right. Like the path dependency of taking this choice when nobody else has kind of made the same choice almost yes. could make up for a lot of other problems. Yeah, so it, it may not just matter, like all the other possible shortcomings. And obviously, every company has their flaws and shortcomings, right? The question is whether that matters, right? Yeah. So I wonder at times, like the fact that it is only Adyen who has chosen the path to do no M&A whatsoever. They are the only company in this whole space. And people probably underestimate this. I think it takes enormous courage to take this path because it's so tempting to just acquire a company, let's say you're not in Africa. You can buy just the company which is doing business in Africa and you integrate, I mean, who knows how much this integration is happening, but hmm. let's say you try to integrate, you know, that company to your system. And then in a while, you have a footprint in Africa or if you don't have a particular product in your system that the customers are demanding. And you say, you know what, it will take probably six months to build this in-house. Let's just acquire this company and then try to integrate that and serve this customer. So it is extremely tempting to do acquisitions in the payment space. And that is why everybody does it. The fact that Adyen has never done it. Again, at a static point of time, like sitting in 2022, it can be difficult to appreciate the long-term impact of this one decision, one rigid decision. You can't build Excel model that has power law implications. You can't. 
you will always be yep. afraid like oh no 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 this company is not definitely not going to grow at 30% in 2030 that's nonsensical right think about amazon like amazon has kept growing at 20% rate for 25 years more than 25 20% rate nobody would have the courage or guts no analyst or investor would have the courage or guts to forecast that level of persistence uh, of revenue or growth for such a long time so it's so easy to underappreciate you know the power of such decision if it is indeed a power law decision right so i'm mindful of that particular mm-hmm. aspect it's possible that despite you know some of the aspects that i may disagree with at the end like i don't know i'm not a payments insider so i'm thinking just from first principles here but it's possible that if that decision is actually so apt that you know your quality of business declines as you acquire more businesses and that the power will be just you know it will exponentially increase that decision that the impact of the decision will just exponentially increase over time right so yeah so you know i actually forgot like what your original question was at this point doesn't like, matter we're, you... we're in a good vein right now i think the question was something like in the future like are the next gen players running away are they improving faster than the legacy players could catch up right so yes i think yes as that's why i was mentioning it like it's possible like so obviously the incumbent players are riddled with acquisitions, riddled with many, many, many different platforms, right? And they are having a hard time in responding to market's needs. There are so many ways of you know, monetizing on the internet now, right? So, and the incumbent players are having difficulty in responding in an agile manner. Some of this, you know, next gen or like disruptors, like Checkout, Stripe, Adyen, they are much better in responding to this new way of monetization in the in the internet but even within that and that's why i, I kind of started with adian that i want like you know all these other fellow disruptors are also they're not as willing or uh, they haven't been riddled with as many acquisitions as legacy incumbents are just by the virtue of being young companies mm-hmm. but if they continue to do it for the next five ten years and maybe in 2030 they will look just like the legacy incumbents, you know, look today, hmm. right? So, and but if Adyen remains the way it is, then they will always seem very agile, very updated, and they just keep chugging along longer than probably many investors or analysts appreciate. So I'm thinking about what we said earlier about PayPal's management and having different shorter term incentives, right? Right. So maybe right. we can basically like do a cut and paste on this discussion and apply it to Pfizer and Global Pay. Like, are all these companies run by yeah. hired management that it's, their incentives are just like that, right? You can't blame them personally necessarily. Like yeah. they're doing what they think is best for the incentive I, that they have. I don't have. think you and I would do any different. Yeah, exactly. Uh, even, even in those positions. Yeah, if I were PayPal CEO, I would look at what my incentives are. I, I would look at, oh, I'm actually getting paid to increase net new actives. Right? That's another thing that I didn't mention when I was discussing incentives. Like PayPal increased like, you know, significantly net new actives, like I think probably 49 million last year and 71 million. These numbers may not be exactly correct. I'm obviously speaking from memory. They increased like more than 100 million of net new actives over the last two years. And now they're saying, a lot of these net new actives were low quality. They hmm. basically joined because of promotion and all that. But if you look at the incentive, they do get paid if their net new active is you know ex- exceeding some threshold. So was PayPal was PayPal's management consciously running aggressive promotion to increase net new actives? Possible, right? Then again, it goes on to the like the board has to take the responsibility there. Like, you know, board accepted and decided that incentive system for the management. Yeah. And yes, if I knew that I get paid by having more net new active, even if, if they were lower quality and I, I need to save my job in the next couple of years, nine out of 10 people would do what, you know, PayPal management did. Potentially did. I, I'm not sure that's what exactly they did, but potentially, you know, what they did would be what exactly uh, other people would do. That's the thing, right? It's almost a cliche at this point to talk about like, oh, founder this, founder that, like founder is so important to have a founder or at least founder mentality, right? Because some founders are not so great. I'm starting to think, you know, for a change, uh, Liberty, uh, sorry to interrupt. I'm starting to see some opinions. Like I know in 2020, 2021, like it was so consensus. Oh, founder-led businesses are so great. And like, you know, they have correct vision and incentives and all that. But 
I think the tide is changing yeah. a little, right? We're seeing it with Toby at Shopify, and some people yes. getting criticized for the same thing that they were getting praised before, right? That's the halo right. effect, right there. Right, right. No, when when your stock like you know stops going up. Now people are saying, hey, why are you not making money? Why you know we, we don't care about revenue? Show us the free cash flow or profit. Like, but I think the difference that I see between founders and management-led companies is basically founder-led companies, generally speaking, with enough voting power, they can afford to think from first principles perspective. Hmm. Even when things get difficult, right? I don't think all companies should optimize for free cash flow in the near term, right? It depends on where you are in your life cycle, what sort of growth trajectory that is left, right? What sort of business you are in or, you know, industry dynamics and all that. Like there's a lot, too many variables to have like a generalized rule of thumb. But if you are management led and you are, you know that your contract is up and you know how you're incentivized and all that, yes, then it can be more tempting for management led companies to stop thinking from first principles and think more about how I, how do I deliver this percentage of free cash flow growth in the next whatever years, right? Yeah. Two years, three years, or next year even. So again, like, you know, not all founder-led companies is going to work out. Just because you are thinking from first principle doesn't mean that you will win or you will your business will thrive. But I do think the base rate should be higher yeah. for companies that are led by people who are thinking from first principles. I agree. I think if you adjust for the number of each, right, because there are a lot fewer founder-led companies at a certain size, right, by the time they're public mm -hmm. and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the number of those that are huge, huge success, there's a disproportionate amount that are founder led or have the strong stamp of their founder, right? Even if the founder is not there anymore, they're still going on the inertia of what the founder created. And when you said like it's the management's responsibility with the incentives, like I think technically that's correct. But I think in practice as a shareholder, if you're like relying on the board to kind of save you, you're already lost, right? Because management yeah. is they basically do what they want with most boards, right? They're totally toothless, right? They, they yeah. don't know anything. They know what management tells them. So if management wants to paint a rosy picture or and go play with golf with them a few times a year and, and you know be charismatic yeah. around them, like most boards I don't feel are super useful, unfortunately. Some are really value added, but not that many. There's one company we didn't talk much about and it's Block. Uh, I, I just can't get over the name. Like it's, it takes so long to build a brand, right? It, to yes. get everybody to have it in your head. Like that's why I still have liberty because like some people change name all the time on Twitter. They change avatar. It's like, no, it takes so long for people to imprint. Mm -hmm. And so don't change it for silly reasons, right? I think I, think I get what Zuckerberg was doing at Facebook with the mm -hmm. meta thing. And it's kind of like more conglomerate now, kind of like Alphabet yeah. at Google. And like, I'll still call it Facebook and I'll still call Google, Google, but I kind of mm -hmm. get his reason. But at, mm -hmm. at Square, I kind of don't get it. But anyway, I'm curious what you think about Square's chances there. They kind of have different strengths, right? With the cash app and more of the you know SMB uh, point of sale stuff. And I'm curious, what's your read on that company and where they're going? I think Block is one of those companies that I, I worked on earlier in my kind of, you know, payments knowledge <laughs> journey, yeah. right? It was the first, uh, I, I, the first block yeah. in the wall, so to speak. <laughs> right, first block, right. And Yes, as I mentioned before, almost all payment companies have potentially exceptionally large market to address, right? And Block is no exception. And they have been incredibly successful in terms of building multiple businesses within this company. Like, you know, they started as a the seller segment. They started to just serve the micro merchants, right, who were terribly underserved. So they started as a, as a company to serve the micro merchants, and they now they are kind of you know going up markets from micro to small to mid, right? And they also ended up building this you know cash up business, right? Now the, the challenge that you know uh, oh and by the way they also acquired Afterpay last year, yeah. which was oh, a yeah, huge a acquisition, one. right? Thankfully they bought it with stocks. Well, I mean. If they bought it, <laughs> it, 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 it with cash, it would be considerably worse. So obviously, still shareholders got, got diluted because they, you know, paid in stocks. But if they paid like you know thirty billion dollar cash, it, it just would have been disaster. Wow. Yeah. Right. So this was like you know obviously they could have probably bought it at a fraction of what they paid. I think they diluted like twenty percent of their shareholders. Look at 
a firm stock in the meantime, yeah. right? And Afterpay would probably have followed a kind of a yeah, similar yeah. trajectory. So, yeah, I think yeah, Afterpay would just be probably down at least fifty percent, if not more, right? Fifty yeah. percent uh, being conservative. So there are the three different businesses here. They are right. Well, I guess broadly two: Square Seller Segment and Cash App. There's one is consumer facing, one is margin facing, and the big basically ambition for Block is to kind of close the loop. Right, so customers would just go to the stores, physical stores, uh, and they would pay via Cash App, so they can just, you know, subvert the card networks and like issuing and like you know the payments value chain altogether. Yeah. Bypass everything, and and right. Block would keep all of the margin, and it exactly. would be cheaper for the customer. Like that, that seems like a great idea if you can pull it off, and that's the hard part. Yes, everybody dreams of that. Almost nobody can pull it off. I did think that Block has perhaps better than average probability to be able to pull it off. I still continue to think that, but I think a lot depends on how they integrate Afterpay, like what sort of incentives they give users or, or consumers to kind of pay via Cash App instead of, let's say, their Apple Pay or credit cards in general. That kind of remains to be seen. I do worry about after pay or any sort of BNPL uh, services. Initially, I thought this is more like a demand generation for the merchants. And almost every BNPL company says this. And I think this is true. I'm not saying this is not true. This is certainly true that you know when you provide BNPL uh, on your website, your you know average order volume increases, sales increases, conversion increases. Th those are all true, right? Obviously, the flip side of that is you are taking credit risk, yeah. right? So when the economy is going through a soft period or basically recession, the thing that I worry about Block or any sort of BNPL companies is if we ha go through a stagflationary period, this is like particularly worse for any sort of BNPL companies. Stagflation means like you have inflation, but real GDP growth is negative, right? So if inflation goes up, the Fed will probably keep raising rates, right? Rates, short-term rates will go up. So your funding cost goes up. But I don't think these BNPL companies will be able to pass that cost to their margins, right? So mm. Afterpay currently charges 4%. So close to what, let's say, margins pay for processing credit card payments, right? The MDR for credit card. So it's like, you know, usually, let's say, 250 to 300 basis points if you are accepting credit card payments. But since BNPL raises your conversion, sales, average order volume, you are more. You should be more than happy to pay the one, extra one percentage point. But the business model may not be able to function if your funding cost raises too much, but you are not being able to, like, you know, if after pay says, hey, we can't make the business work with 4% take rates, we need 7%, 8%. Right, because the Fed rate is like five percent, whatever. Like I, I'm not saying Fed rate is five percent or going to be five percent. I'm just giving you an example. Yeah. So if if that happens, then the economics, and again, like I'm just talking about like in a unit economics here. I'm not even touching on the fact that in a recession you obviously have more credit losses. That's the thing, right? They get squeezed on both sides. Like the, the funding yes. costs go up, but they also get more credit losses, and you know people yes. not paying on time and. Yes, and there are companies like, you know, Apple is also, you know, getting into BNPL and all that. And they may not need to jack up those, you know, take rates uh, to the margin. They can say, you know what, 4% or whatever, like they can just give the lowest, right? Yeah, they have a pile of cash that's just sitting there, right? They may as well use part of it and a couple billion here, a couple billion there, and yeah. they're funded. That's definitely a potential problem, like how Block is going to deal with that. And also like... Because this is a transaction business, right? If economy go through, I think there will be a pretty high correlation mm. in terms of what's happening with the with the economy and how blocks payments businesses is, is going with. So I think it can be challenging for some someone like Block if the economy goes through an extended recessionary period. We don't like we don't know like to what extent. Like we don't know the depth and breadth of this recession, potential recession, right? So in a way, we are kind of taking a macro call there, if you are bullish or bearish, whatever way for Block. So I think it is going to be difficult for a payment company uh, such as Block. 
and also even for cash app business they have i, th I think they you know their uh, large demography is like low income population right they can be even more affected because of potential recession so there are too many variables for anyone to have very high conviction i think how the business is going to fare i, I guess market definitely reflects that like i think the stock is yeah. down like 80 percent or something like that so yes i think market kind of understands a, a range of outcomes is sort of widening for block and some of the other players in the space as well like Affirm and and some of the BNPL players. I was I was just looking at Klarna, which is, is a private company, but you know they're raising money and they are they have they are kind of you know decreasing their valuation by I think more than 50, 60 percent or something like that. So yeah, it's it's been a difficult period for a lot of these payments companies. There's another interesting dynamic in the space I wanted to talk about. It's the relationship between Shopify and Stripe, because yeah. ShopPay is kind of like its own thing, right? Its own animal, its own competitor in the race. But Stripe is powering ShopPay. Mm -hmm. And uh, Shopify is Stripe's biggest customer as a kind of a aggregate across the Shopify network of, of sites. And so what I've heard, I think from Jerry and others, is basically that Shopify is driving a ton of volume through Stripe, but at very, very low margins, basically, mm -hmm. because they have incredible leverage over Stripe. Like right now, they're the best of friends, right? They're partners, like, Toby and the Collision Brothers seem like like personal friends even. But the dynamic is very interesting because any day push came to shove, right? Shopify could turn around and say, okay, now our processor is Adyen or whoever else, right? Checkout or something. Yeah. So Stripe doesn't have much leverage with such a big customer. Maybe years ago, it was a bigger percentage of the total Stripe volume, and now it's probably getting smaller. So yeah. maybe that part of it is, is improving for them, but it's still kind of a... I don't know. I think it's an interesting dynamic, right? It's business, right? They, they're not doing Shopify a favor. They're not like, oh yeah, we're going to do it at a low margin out, out of the goodness of our hearts. It's probably just they don't have the leverage against Shopify. But I wonder, is this leverage going to flip at some point if Stripe has grown enough outside of Shopify and can they try to increase rates there? And I, I don't know. I'm curious to know if you have any thoughts on this. Yeah, no, I think uh, that's an interesting dynamic for sure. You're absolutely right. I think few years ago, I saw somewhere like Shopify was like, I don't know, 20, 25% of Stripe's uh, TPV, total, total payments volume. I think right now it's probably low double digit or mid teens at best. So, you know, definitely Stripe's dependence on Shopify is declining, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know like what really is the extent of that relationship between Shopify and Stripe or what really thought process was from Toby to be fully dependent. Do we know if it's exclusive? Is Shopify not using any other processors at all? Like I think so, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not 100% sure, but yes, that is the impression I have that, you know, it's predominantly Stripe. And I think it, even if they're not using Stripe, it's probably because Stripe is not there. Right, in some countries maybe. Yeah, because Shopify pay, payment is basically available, I think, in less than 20 countries right now. Mm. Uh, and I don't exactly remember how many countries Stripe is available, I, I'm, but I'm pretty sure it's more than 20 countries. Okay, because the normal playbook for someone who has tens and tens and tens of billions of payment would probably be to have like three, four, five different processors and yes. splitting the volume among them and like, okay, I'm gonna give this much to Pfizer and this much to Global Pay. And, and so if Shopify is not doing that and is kind of exclusive with Stripe, Stripe has probably given them something in return, like probably those very low rates. And so they've yeah. kind of been like, you know, synergistically growing together. But at some point this may break and this may be a, an interesting moment in the space. So I own some Shopify as well. And I would probably feel better if Shopify had relationship with, let's say, both Adyen and Stripe or, or some other companies. And because payment is such a huge revenue, Yes, I think Shopify still has leverage in that relationship between Stripe and Shopify. But if Stripe keeps growing and if Stripe grows at a much faster rate than Shopify does and Shopify becomes less than 5% or whatever, you know, GMV or TPV for Stripe and Stripe, if Stripe thinks that, you know what, like we are very much entrenched in that relationship and we haven't rent any money that's possible. We don't know. I'm, I'm just speculating here. Yep. 
Stripe founders can say, you know what, we haven't made any money at all from Shopify, even though we have you know, processed all this volume for so many years. So let's do some renegotiation and basically ask for some margins, right? Mm -hmm. Even if it's like, you know, 500 basis points, extra margin, let's say, I'm not sure like, you know, what's their margin is basically, but let's say if they are generating, I don't know, like 10%, like 5% gross margin or something like that, let's say, and they want it to increase to 10%, right? That can definitely strain that relationship. And I think Shopify is in a, is a, in a place where there can be many other PSPs who would be, you know, vying for that position. And they're right? going to get good prices from these other processors, yes. right? Because they have so much volume. Basically, they're in a great position negotiating with anyone at this point. Yes. So uh, I'm a little surprised that they have chosen to be chosen to go express. I'm pretty sure, like I said, probably Stripe doesn't make much money at all from that relationship. But that sort of dependence can be a source for fragility over the long run. Again, like, you know, Toby talks about building company for 100 years, right? So yep. if you take the horizon in 100 years, let's say both Stripe and Shopify is alive, right? Do I really want to build a 100-year company with an exclusive relationship with another, you know, with dependency on another company when payments is such a huge part of my, like, revenue, right? Yeah. So uh, I'm a little surprised with the dynamic of the relationship, but, you know, in business, those relationships can change. Yeah, well, to me, it feels like an artifact of the moment in time when both companies came up, right? Yeah. They grew up together. They were probably personal friends. They were kind of both trying to do things a bit differently. And like, they were a, a very good match for one another. But I would be very surprised if like, in five years, it was still an exclusive relationship. At some point, it's like the sums of money are just too high. You're a public company. Like, it's not a startup anymore. It's not like, oh, I'm going to hire mm. my friend. Or like, at some point, I think that's going to change. On the margin side, like if Stripe really is giving them a great deal and not making much money, I guess Shopify can't complain too much. Maybe it's on the technical side. If there's ever like a big outage at Stripe, right? They have technical problems and Shopify loses a ton of money mm. because they can't process transactions for a while. Maybe they have a backup processor that we just don't know about and this is all yeah. taken care of. Like I, I wouldn't be surprised if that's the case because these are very, very smart people. So they, they probably have plan A, B, C, D, and E, right? But yeah. still, even with the majority of the transactions, most giant companies seems to be constantly like they, they pull on different levers and like, OK, we're, mm -hmm. today we're going to give 30 percent of our volume to Adyen and 20 percent of this one. And, and they play them one against the other and they, they yes. constantly test like, is the authorization rate really that much better with this one? How about this one? How about in this country? How about in this currency? Mm -hmm. right? They're mm -hmm. always fiddling with all this stuff. So I wouldn't be surprised to see Shopify become more, I guess, typical in that way. Possible, yes. I wouldn't rule it out. I don't have any time frame in mind whether that can change in five years, three years, ten years, twenty years. But yes, the longer I, like the longer time horizon I think about, the less likely it seems that Stripe will be an exclusive partner with Shopify. So right now, what you know, Amazon and Shopify itself is like more than fifty percent of US's e-commerce GMV, right? So these two companies, like you know. I don't think any payment companies are making money on this. <laughs> yeah, I don't think Amazon is giving much margin either. Yeah, right. So, yes, I, 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 as long as Shopify just keeps growing at a rapid pace, yeah, Stripe may not never be able to find themselves in a position to, to really ask for better margins from Shopify. But you're right. You know, it's possible that you know they they may have like you know uh, other relationships which we just don't know a lot about and. It's possible Shopify utilizes them from time to time. But I have looked at like Shopify's 10K for some time before, so I, I don't exactly remember whether they're exclusive, but definitely Stripe is probably process ninety percent of at least at least ninety percent of like, you know, Shopify's shop like shop base volume. I think it's kind of funny to think about how Stripe has higher take rate because they're mostly in SMBs, right? So it's very fragmented, like people don't have leverage over them so they can charge more. And if Stripe was processing the payments for all of Shopify's merchants individually, they would make great money. But because Shopify has aggregated them all together, now Shopify is not a SMB anymore. It's like a huge enterprise contract. And on yes. enterprise contracts, you make the money kind of Adyen's way, right? By being more efficient and being 
super great at authorization. You don't make the money by kind of like, you know, having leverage over the customer. So it's like Stripe is making most of its profits in this hugely fragmented market. They probably kind of wish sometimes that Shopify had just left payments entirely up to each merchant and most of them probably would would have gone with Stripe. But now because yeah. they, they're all together in one big bundle, well, suddenly it's, it's an enterprise deal. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that, that's about what I have for the big ones. But before we go, I just want to ask quickly about some of the ones that we haven't talked much about, but that may be mm -hmm. like, they may come out of nowhere and become big players like Apple Pay and Google Pay. And we talked a bit about Amazon, the pay with Prime. I think that's, they have this kind of differentiated angle, but any thoughts about Apple Pay, Google Pay, and maybe check out? Yeah, I think we kind of touched on this. And yeah, Apple Pay, Google Pay, MetaPay, uh, WhatsApp Pay, right? Oh, yeah. WhatsApp is pretty big outside the US, right? So, and I think Meta is definitely trying to monetize the WhatsApp part of the business more seriously than ever before. Apple Pay is already like way big. We don't yeah. know the exact numbers. I think they process more than PayPal, right? Really? Yes. Wow, okay, that's impressive. I don't know exactly whether the TPV is higher than PayPal because, you know, PayPal's TPV includes not only the branded processing, but also the unbranded processing. Right. right? Braintree and yeah. Yeah. But Tim Cook actually said in 2019, so it's been three years now, he mentioned something like, we processed more than PayPal last quarter. So, and think about it, like, you know, if you have a billion install base of iPhone users, which are perhaps the wealthiest, you know, billion yeah. in the world. So <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if this 1 billion iPhone users purchasing capacity is actually higher than the... The rest of all of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's possible, right? That's possible. And if you have that, like I bought iPhone this year, right? And got an Apple Pay. I got Apple Card and I think they have me, right? Hmm. So, yeah. Yes, I think I'm going to use Apple. Like, the only way I can, I will use any other... Like, so I'll click any other button is basically if Amazon like ensures that, you know, they are going to deliver this one day in a one day or two day, if I click their button. Other than that, it's going to be very challenging for other players or other buttons to tempt me to click. Like, obviously, if I'm buying something from Instagram and Instagram gives me only, you know, Facebook pay option, then obviously I'll have to click that. But PayPal doesn't have that power, right? Yeah, right. the distribution is... Yeah, so the other thing that I kind of worried about was, so PayPal is not on Amazon, right? But they are on Shopify powered stores. Right. In 2015, 32% of Shopify's GMB went via in a shop pay, right? They processed 32% of the uh, Shopify's GMB. In 2021, that was like almost 50%. So from 32% to 50%. So if we move forward another five years, 10 years, probably ShopPay will process 70, 75% of their total GMP. Who is losing share? PayPal. Yeah, unless maybe Amazon pay with Prime really takes off in, in the meantime. Yeah. So PayPal is not on Amazon and may gradually lose share on Shopify. And those two are the largest. So right now, they are more than 50% of you know, e-commerce GMP in the US and I don't think it's, you know, nonsensical to assume that in 2030, the GMV share in the US for Amazon and Shopify could actually be even larger, right? Yeah. And there could, it could be just in a pure power law distribution. And if that's the case, PayPal is in a tough spot. Yeah, because right? most of the profits come from that branded yes. checkout, right? Even if it's not a huge part of the revenue, it's a huge part of the profits. Yeah, no, it's still a huge part of the revenue more than 50%, but probably on a profit basis, gross profit basis or operating profit basis is probably, I don't know, 70% or something wow, like that. Okay. So Apple Pay doesn't allow users to add PayPal as a payment method, right? Google Pay does, Facebook Pay does, but what is the guarantee that Google Pay and Facebook Pay and Samsung Pay will always allow you to add PayPal as one of the methods, right? So they're in a kind of tough spot uh, from those angles. And like I said, payment business can be very, very profitable. And like for a lot of these big tech companies, they have such a valuable property on the internet or property, like, you know, the iPhone is a very valuable property uh, to have like a billion install base. I think they're just trying to figure out how to monetize these relationships, right? And if basically Facebook or Google notices that, you know what, PayPal is making most of our payments relationship, revenue from our payments relationship, 
they'll really squeeze PayPal. Like even if they allow, the margin won't be they, there. They'll just squeeze them, right? They'll say, hey, they are actually clicking on Google Pay, but they have PayPal as a payment method. But if they click Google Pay, you have to give like this percentage. You have to share this percentage with us, right? And that can go very high. Like you know, there is no limit in terms of how much they can squeeze, unless the antitrust committee has a different opinion on on those sort of in a revenue share. Yeah, though payment companies are not the most like, you know, politicians won't win a ton of votes by defending them, so they, they may not get attention that something more consumer citizen facing would get. I don't want to underestimate Lena Khan's ambition in in terms of yeah. making big tech's lives difficult. So I, I, yeah, that's I, true. I, I won't want to rule that out. That's true. It feels like PayPal is kind of like a child of the open web era. And so as long as everything was going on in the website somewhere, like they had this equal playing field, right? But now we're more in a world where everything is happening inside of platforms, you know, people are on their iPhones and inside of apps. And even Mm -hmm. Shopify is kind of like a commerce platform. Yes. So PayPal doesn't own any of those platforms. They're kind of Mm -hmm. like this thing that's grafted onto something else, right? But any day they could wake up and some door could slam in their face, right? So that's a tough spot to be in. Yes, yes. That, that's my concern as well. All right, I think this was a pretty good overview for payments. I feel like my brain's gonna explode with all of this stuff now. <laughs> so I'm gonna digest this for a bit. Uh, thank you so much for doing this. I hope the listener has learned a few things and enjoyed the ride. Have a good day, my friend, take care. Thanks again for inviting me. We probably rambled a lot more on payments. so. It is the onus on the listeners to find the coherence. <laughs> if there's any. <laughs> if there's any, right? Right. No, if the uh, listener yeah. wants some coherence, I, I'm going to link your, uh, your deep dives in the show notes. So if anyone listening to this is not super familiar with payments, that's a great place to start. I'm also going to link uh, David Kim's write-ups. Yes, I think that would be great. I uh, appreciate you know conversation and to do it some point again. Maybe I'll be the first person to be the third guest on your podcast. Well, you're in the lead, so (laughs) there's a good chance. Have a good day, man. Bye-bye. Yeah, you too. Bye.